Hi, I'm Jessica, and when I'm not drinking all the coffee, watching Razorback sports, or hanging out with my family of boys, it's my passion to help elementary music teachers just like you find your unique teaching style. My goal with this podcast is to share helpful tips, strategies, and to give you the motivation you need to gain momentum in your teaching so you can continue being the music teacher rock star you already are. Hey everyone, I'm so excited to have you back for episode 88 of the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. Today is an interview with Allison Krosky, and she's going to be talking about the ORF approach, but especially when it comes to movement and improvisation. Now, you'll notice sometimes on the podcast, we have some repeated themes, and so I have had some guests come on before to talk about the ORF approach, but what I love about it is they each are unique teachers that are using their own unique unique teaching style. And so she is going to tell you about what she does in her classroom, specifically, like I said, the ORF approach with movement and improvisation. She has some incredible ideas to share with you. So I know you're going to get a lot out of this episode. Allison is an elementary general music teacher from Cincinnati, Ohio, and she received her bachelor's and master's degrees in music education from Miami University. She has completed all three levels of ORF show work and ORF curriculum and utilizes the ORF approach in her classroom every day. She currently serves on her local ORF chapter's executive board. She's presented lessons at her ORF chapter's sharing day as well as countywide professional development days too. You can find lots of her ideas on social media. You can find her at Mallets and Music. And she's on there on social media as Mallets and Music. She and her husband, Greg, live in Cincinnati, Ohio with their two black labs, Cameron and Katie. And she actually just had her first baby, too. So she's a new mama. And so a lot of you listening that are parents can relate to that as well. So like I said, this episode's incredible. I love having guests on the podcast because... Everybody has different ideas to share, and I'm hoping that you listening to this podcast get so many great ideas to walk away with to implement in your own classroom. So let's dive right in with today's episode with Allison Krosky. All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today by Allison, and you heard me introduce her a little bit in the intro, but I would love for Allison to just go ahead and tell us a little bit more about herself. And so Welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you. Thanks. I'm really excited to be talking with you and sharing some of my awesome ideas. I'm talking about my um, career as an elementary general music teacher. Uh, This is my 10th year of teaching, my decade of teaching. Um, And I started off um, with both my bachelor's and my master's from Miami University in Ohio. That's where I'm based. I'm living and working in Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, I went into college thinking that I was going to be a high school band director and then decided that I did not like score study at all. And I liked my general music classes a lot more. (laughs) So I switched my brain around and um, ended up teaching uh, general music then from the get go uh, for the last 10 years. I've taught the gamut. I've done K to five, first through fourth grade. And now just this year, I started a new job teaching only first and second grade. Um, elementary general music. So that's been a big change, but a lot of fun. I um, also have done a lot of uh, training through the ORF Shore work process. I've taken all three levels of certification as well as doing a curriculum course through that. So I utilize the ORF Shore work process in every single lesson that I do. I'm a big ORFI person. I'm part of my local chapter. I go to a conference, all those kinds of things. So that's really where a lot of my ideas and my inspiration come from. Hmm. I love talking to music teachers because isn't it funny going into college, how you just in your head, I'm going to do this. I'm just want to do secondary music because, you know, I've either been in band or choir and I don't want to just teach the little kids. And then somehow you kind of have a heart change. And then it, um, I think there's just sometimes a misconception in what really happens in an elementary music room. Mm-hmm. You just, once you get in there, you're like, man, this is so fun. Why would I ever want to do anything else? <laughs> it's not even a job. I just get to sing and play games and play instruments and make music all day long. It doesn't even feel like a job sometimes. <laughs> right. Exactly. I know. You're like, if you just could get a little understanding of what I get paid to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. So I know this is a tricky question, but if you could name, it could be more than one thing about what's your favorite thing about teaching elementary music, what would you say? 
Um, I would say the fun that the students and I get to have together. So not just like the fun that they are experiencing, because I hope that my classroom is fun for them and what I plan, um, but also the fact that we get to do it together and I get to have fun with them and experience that joy of music making. Because that's really what I want to try and do is not just have the students experience things for themselves, but have me be a part of it as well. Have them mm. be creative uh, musicians and have me give them ideas, them give me ideas and kind of have a back and forth, even as first and second graders. They can, we can still have that kind of relationship where we're doing things together and creating the music together. Mm, I love that. No, I think that's great because it is so true. There's different teaching philosophies, but I love how you put that. It's not just about you teaching them, but experiencing music and creating it with them. Um, I mean, I think kids learn a lot by just watching, you know, you modeling it and watching mm -hmm. how much you love music is going to be contagious and wanting, making them want to learn it. So I love that answer so much. Yeah. All right. So today we're going to talk about the ORF process, but specifically, and I love this because this has not been talked about a lot on this podcast about movement and improvisation. And so I want to start off by asking you, um, I love asking this question because there's so many different ways um, you find out when I ask this question about how did you learn about the ORF process? Um, we'll start off by that. So how did you find out about ORF? Um, well, just like about probably everybody else who went through college as a music educator, you learn about all of the different processes and theories in college, but you learn about all of them basically on the same playing field, just a little bit um, here and there. And then when I got my first job in, of teaching, you know, those first two years, you're just trying to keep your head above water. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really doing a lot of one way or the other. I was just like, let's just get through day to day kind of stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but then um, after my first two years, I uh, changed jobs and moved back to Cincinnati. And Cincinnati has a really awesome local ORF chapter. We have a huge ORF chapter with lots of awesome teachers. And I got involved in that and started attending workshops. And I was like, oh man, this is like legit. Mm -hmm. I love this. This is so much fun. And it really was giving me a sense of like, okay, this is kind of what I should be doing in my classroom. So I kept attending workshops and then I started, I went and took um, level one during my master's. And that just, you know, after you take a level one course, whether it be Kodai or ORF or whatever you're doing, it totally changes your perspective of how you are teaching and what you are doing in your classroom. Oh, so that's what happened really? for me is I took level one. I was like, man, I have to redo all of the things that I'm going to teach now this next year because this is awesome. Yeah. Um, and then I um, subsequently took level two the summer after that and inputted all of that. Since then, I've just done more workshops and conferences, taken level three, and just added more and more and more ORF into my classroom so that now it's like 95% ORF stuff that I am doing in my classroom. And I, I really love it because it's all inclusive mm. for my students. It's really easy for me to differentiate both high and low for my kids, but also from year to year. You get so many different ideas from the lessons and the activities and different ways you can do things that even if I'm doing the same song every year, it might be slightly different based off what that grade level is doing. Mm -hmm. I like how you just said that um, because I feel like this is something completely off topic, but you made me think about it. I feel like sometimes teachers, when I talk to them about planning, they're so stressed out about having a different song for each grade level. And you don't necessarily have to do that. You know, you can do this, like you teach first and second grade. So are there times where you're doing the same song, but just maybe doing something slightly different with each of the grade levels? Oh, yeah. I mean, especially right now, at the right now, you know, we're in September when we're recording this mm -hmm. and we're doing... Um, a lot of the same fall songs, but in first grade, we would do things with like movement and steady beat and just starting out with rhythms and singing voice. But then I'll revisit and use the same song in second grade, but now we're starting to identify the solfege notes of it mm -hmm. and identify the rhythms and use it for a composition or an improvisation piece. But they already have that understanding of the basis of the song from first grade, and it's a great way to scaffold that and yeah. have those, those songs that you can then go on and on and on. And when I you know, used to teach first, second, third, and fourth grade, there would be songs that I would use the same song in all four grade levels throughout their course of my classroom because it was just a great song that I could do that way. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And so teachers listening, it's okay to not plan a different song for each grade level. But first of all, that's a lot of planning. And it's okay if there's weeks that it happens that way. There's, it just depends on the week you're planning. But I completely agree with that. Make and your I, life easier. Use yes, the same song. Yes. And I think part of it is they're like, well, the kids are going to get bored. No, they're not. Because like you said, you're doing different things to each you know, with each grade level. And so, and even if it's yeah. the exact same thing every year, if you're using it more as a review in a higher grade level, they might've loved that activity as a first or second grader and you can come back and they'll be so excited. I mean, you know, I play the, the game with the doggy doggy, where's your bone. Mm -hmm. And even my fourth graders wanted to play doggy doggy, where's your bone <laughs> when they were in fourth grade, because they loved that game so much. Yeah. So just bring it, bring it all back. It's totally oh, yeah. fine. Oh yeah. Okay. So I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk about doing movement. I know this is probably something you get a lot of questions about at first. Um, not at first. I don't know why I said at first. You get a lot of questions about, um, but I feel like a lot of times it's with anything in music, whenever, you know, maybe there's a teacher listening that hasn't done a lot of movement with their students. And so they're just a little nervous about it because they're like, well, I'm uncomfortable. What if they make fun of me? Or what if I look weird in front of the kids? And so the first thing I want to ask you is how do you help your students become comfortable with doing movement activities in music? I think a big part of it and I understand people who are not comfortable with movement themselves and their own bodies. I think a big part of it is that you have to get out of your comfort zone as the teacher. And um, because you have to demonstrate for those kids that it is okay to move your body in a different way than what you're used to. Um, so when I start doing creative movement with my students at the beginning of the year as warm ups, and we're just moving around the room and we're shaking body parts out. I make sure that I am doing the creative movement with the kids because then if they don't feel comfortable, they can model what I'm doing or if they feel comfortable, they can go nuts with it and yeah. they can really get into it. So just that creative movement aspect is really what I start with. Um, I also like to utilize a movement word wall in my classroom for those students who might not have those inert creative ideas. Um, so we, I have a list of all these locomotor and non-locomotor words, stationary, non-stationary, and we'll input those words into just basic songs. Like recently we did in first grade, um, the song Jim Along Josie. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I do it with jump Jim Along, Jim Along Josie, and then we would clap and then I'd have the kids pick out a word. Oh, let's march. And then somebody would pick out another word. Okay, let's wiggle this time. Um, but then eventually the kids might pick out their own word because, you know, there's always that one kid who says, oh, I want to floss. Well, that's not on my word wall, but okay, we can do that. Um, <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. Um, and I can floss just like the rest of them. I taught myself how to floss, so I didn't look like an idiot in front of my um, kids. I still cannot. I have tried so many times. It was like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> it took a couple months. I had to, like, slow it down. It was, it was intense. Oh, goodness. But, that's definitely like how I would start if I was a teacher who was nervous about movement is just doing those kind of creative movements to not only get myself out of my comfort zone, but also my kids. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love the word wall idea. That is genius because I feel like kids do sometimes get stuck on, well, what do I do? Or like when you're just like, pick a movement and they're like, uh, you know, but yeah, exactly. the word wall is such a great idea. I love that. And it's up all the time, so they can always just like see. And that's great for if you ever get to the point later on in movement, if you're doing like movement sequencing or folk dance creating with your older kids, they can also then use those words that they've been practiced to look at. Mm -hmm. And they can see those and use those in their movement compositions as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love that. That's great. Okay. So movement compositions, tell us more about that. <laughs> well, that's definitely, you know, down the line, once you've done a lot of, yes. movement. um, so I, you know, after the, um, creative movement, I do a lot of folk dancing in my classroom. I do a lot of things with the, um, rhythmically moving by Phyllis Weikert and the new England dance masters, um, collections. They have a lot of great folk songs in there to kind of get the idea of, putting steps together and sequencing different movement parts. Um, and then from there, 
I like to um, kind of have the kids, one of my favorite ways to do a movement composition is to have the kids look at a picture of something. Mm-hmm. And um, so like in second grade, I, I do one with stars and different constellations. So the students would be looking at a picture of a constellation and we would decide how we are going to move to follow the shape of that constellation. And so we'd use, you know, maybe a word from the movement word wall or some other way. And we would create that pathway with our bodies to form that constellation. And we'd have to decide, are we going to move for four beats or eight beats or 12 beats, however long we need. And we then put that together and, okay, we've made our constellation movement. Now maybe we'll make a stationary movement like a star. Mm -hmm. So that would be like a B section. And then maybe we'll make the constellation again as an A section. So we would go, you know, constellation movement for A, stationary movement for B, constellation movement for A again. And we just made a movement composition Mm -hmm. that we could then put to some music, maybe sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star while we do it. Who knows? So that's kind of like the general idea of what I do with when I like sequence those kinds of things with my little kids that way. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. I mean, and that goes right into what we're going to talk about in a little bit is improvisation. Um, <laughs> so we'll bring that, we'll definitely bring that back up. But before we move on, I want to ask you, when it comes to movement, there's so many different types of movement to do in the music room. And so I would love to hear about how do you vary up activities and how do you know what you're wanting to plan when, when it comes to doing movement in your classroom? When I am planning just in general for my curriculum and also with movement, I try and make sure there's at least one movement based activity every day for my students, mm. whether it's our warm up, whether it's the main part of our thing, whether it's something at the end, because I think those kids come into the music room or any room and you know, they need to move. They need to get some wiggles out. Oh, yeah. So we try and incorporate that. Um, sometimes it might just be a standalone folk dance. Let's just do a folk dance because we need to move. Sometimes it's one of those fun little play parties like Jim Along Josie, where we're picking out words. Um, Sometimes it's more curriculum based. Um, If I need to do some body percussion for an orc song that I'm doing, or um, if we need to do kind of like a circle game for the song that we are going to be using rhythms or um, bard instruments for, that'll go along with that. So it really depends on kind of what my structure of the rest of my day looks like and what rhythm and melody lessons I'm doing for that day. If the movement lesson incorporates with it, or if the movement lesson is just a standalone, let's move our bodies and get our wiggles out kind of idea. I love that you said you like to have your students move, you know, every time they come to you. And, you know, and I think when music teachers think of movement, they just think of creative movement. Well, it's all creative movement, you know, but I like that you do a variety of folk dancing and creative movement with improv, or like you said, sometimes it just goes right along with the song or even body percussion. Um, That is definitely movement as well. But yeah, those Mm -hmm. kiddos need to move their bodies. They got to get up and move. I mean, it's very important. (laughs) You know, that gets them and yourself, you know, more used to doing that movement so that then you can become more able to use it in your classroom kind of idea. Right. Okay. So let's, we talked a little bit about improv when it comes to Mm -hmm. movement. And so we talked about the star idea you gave us. Yeah. Um, And so that is, honestly, that is improv. It can be as simple as that. And so um, this leads me right into my next question is when it comes to improv with your students, what's the easiest way to approach this for a new teacher who's maybe never done anything with improvisation before? I mean, exactly the same kind of thing I'm going to say that I said with movement. You got to try it yourself and try it out and become comfortable with it yourself so that you can show it off to your students as well. Um, And just like with creative movement, kind of improvisation ideas, start really simple. When I start um, improvisation with my my first graders, it's usually always body percussion, hand drums, or rhythm sticks, because those are three things that are really easy for them to manipulate and they feel very comfortable doing. So if I was doing kind of like a movement or body percussion improvisation, I would just let the kids just try out different sounds on their bodies and not have it be metered to start. Let's just see what we can do. What kind of sounds can your body make? Same thing you can do on the drum. What kind of sounds can your drum make? Then I would start structuring it into kind of a metered 
feel. Hmm. So then, okay, well, how many, how many different sounds can you make on your drum by the time I ding my triangle on beat four? Ooh, that sounded good. Okay. You know, try that again. Same idea with your body. Um, and we would go through that over and over and over and over again. And that's kind of the basis of just starting improvisation with my students on those really, really simple unpitched percussion instruments or with your own body as the percussion instrument. Okay. That's great. Um, and like you said, it just, with anything, you know, teaching, it just takes time. And if Mm -hmm. you're uncomfortable with it, just getting in there and doing it and figuring it out, man, I'm thinking back to the first time I tried to do improvisation with kids and it was like a total bomb, but maybe not. But what's funny is it's always like when it sounds like complete chaos in your classroom, but you have like some kind of improvisation activity going on with your students. And right then as you know, like when your principal walks by and it's like complete noise, noise fest. And it's like, it's controlled chaos, but it looks like everybody, you're just basically like going, do whatever you want today, but there's, there really is a structure to yeah, it. Yeah, because <laughs> I mean, there, with improvisation, especially at an elementary level, there really are no wrong answers. It's mm-hmm. just trying it out and putting yourself out there and having the kids put themselves out there. So that's, you know, one of the things that I try and make sure I instill in my kids is like, there's no wrong answer. Do what you want. Yeah. Because you're improvising. You are making it up right there on the spot. You are not planning it out. Yeah. It's whatever your brain imagines for that moment. Yeah. Okay. So you told us that you start off with maybe non-metered improvisation and then move on to metered. And so are there any other rules? I don't want to use the word rules, but you know, you know what I mean by that. Instructions you give your students like parameters when it comes to improvisation. I have a um, poster in my room that the kids always think is the funniest thing because it says the word kiss on it. And they're like, why do you have a poster that says kiss? That's gross. Ew. But really, it just says K-I-S-S. And underneath it, it says, keep it simple, silly. Yes. And, you know, you've heard, people have probably heard that all over the place. I first heard it when I was in jazz band in high school, except for because we were high schoolers, my jazz band director said, keep it simple, stupid. Yes. Uh, but I can't do that to elementary kids. <laughs> so it's silly. <laughs> you got to change it a little bit. <laughs> I got to change it a little bit. Um, but that, that hangs in my room. And so for any improvisation we do, now I really um, reference it, especially when we're doing the bard instrument improvisation. And I'll talk about that here in a second. But, yeah, uh, yeah. The, w- with any improvisation that we're doing, keeping it simple, or even composition, I mean, really would work too. Um, Keeping it simple, silly is the main thing. And so that's why I have it hanging in my room right there. So um, speaking of barred instruments, because I didn't touch on this, I just talked about unpitched percussion beginning. And I know, you know, as an ORF teacher, having barred instrument improvisation is probably even more scary Mm. and nerve wracking than doing unpitched percussion improvisation because there is that added element of the melodic structure. Right. So when I start improvisation on the bard instruments, um, I usually just start us with improvising rhythms on a singular note. So we'll just start with, if we're in, you know, C pentatonic or whatever, we'll start on do, we'll start on C and we'll try out a rhythm on that note for four or eight beats. Once the students feel comfortable with one note, okay, now try improvising with do and re, C and D. They try it out. I give them some ideas back and forth, back and forth. Then the three notes. Then if they're doing good with that, maybe in the same class, maybe in another class, I'll go to four notes or five notes Mm -hmm. until I get the whole pentatonic do, re, mi, so, la thing. Um, Keeping in mind to tell the students that they always got to end on do and they need to keep it simple. And then the other like tip that I give my students, so they have the keep it simple, silly tip, always end on do tip. And then the last one was actually made up by one of my kids um, about three or four years ago. They always come up with the best ideas. Oh, they completely do. (laughs) Um, He said that your mallets have to play tag. So when one mallet moves up the instrument, the other mallet has to follow. When one mallet moves down the instrument, the other mallet has to follow. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is genius. Yeah. Because that way the kids aren't trying to make these giant jumps in their improvisations 
that don't sound good. They're mm-hmm. going from like do to la to re to, yes. and it, it doesn't sound good at all. But if their mallets play tag, then they get that stepwise motion without me having to go into like music theory of like, you have to move stepwise and you have to go up this way and down this yeah. way. They just play tag and it yes. totally works. So besides kissing the music, I would say that those are my like three improvisation rules for um, the bard instruments. Always end on do, kiss the music, mallets play tag. I love that. That's a genius idea your student came up with, but kids really do have the best ideas. Yeah, you're like, I mean, I have a degree and you're sitting there like, <laughs> what? <laughs> this 10 year old just like totally owned me on what we should be doing with our instruments. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, okay. So I just thought of something else I want to ask you. Okay. So when it comes to improvisation with the unpitched and then the pitch percussion instruments, how much of a mixture of improvising with both of them? Do you have your whole class do improvising on um, unpitched and then all of them improvising on pitch instruments or a mixture of it all? Well, this is going to be a silly answer. It depends. No. yeah song. no that's fine you know mm-hmm. um usually you know at the beginning it would be everybody doing all of the same kind of timbre of improvisation um but then once they get more comfortable then i would pro- then you know i would move into doing a little bit of both once we get to the bard instrument improvisation it's kind of like starting all over mm-hmm. everybody is improvising on the bard instruments all at the same time or if they want to do a solo, they could do a solo. Yeah. Um, but that way we're all learning and doing the same thing together. So once they get comfortable on the bard instrument improvisation, that's when I would probably start doing a little bit of bard instruments over here, maybe some drums over there, maybe another group's doing movement. And that would be kind of where you start moving from improvisation into a little bit more of composition. Mm -hmm. Because then if we're doing like group projects, the group would be able to choose what they wanted to do. And maybe one group chooses to do movement. One group chooses to do unpitched percussion. One group chooses to do the bard instruments or one group chooses to do all three because they're crazy, but (laughs) (laughs) they're not keeping it simple, silly. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) But when I start off, I start off with one timbre, one medium of improvisation kind of thing and then move through it that way. Mm-hmm. That's great advice. Okay. Um, so before we go, I would love for you to share any other advice that you have for the teachers listening to this episode. Well, um, I think the biggest thing that I've learned in the last, you know, 10 years, decade of teaching that I would impart is to be a sponge. I just told this to a college student a couple of weeks ago who was kind of doing a little interview like this uh, for one of her classes. And I told her, you know, no matter what you're doing, what class you're in, what workshop you're in, whatever teacher you're talking to, listen and take everything in that you can. Uh, because you might not be able to use it all, but there might be a little tidbit here and there that you find that sticks with you. Um, and I can attest to that even at, you know, ORF workshops or even national conference. When I go to these things, I'm not going to take every single activity, every single lesson, every single idea back with me to my classroom because I only am going to take what I know works with my kids. But when I find those little things that work with my kids, I'm like, oh, that was totally worth it. But I wanted to make sure that I had myself open up to that. Mm-hmm. So that would be my first thing is to be a sponge. And then, especially because we've been talking about movement and improvisation, I would say that it's okay to make mistakes, even as the teacher. You know, we mentioned a lot, of, a lot today about how you need to be vulnerable in having movement in your body and improvisation in your own self. And so you need to show those kids that it's okay to make a mistake. Even as adults, we're not perfect. Um, so it's cool for the kids to see if you make a mistake because then they don't feel so self-conscious when they make a mistake. And they're like, oh, but Mrs. Krosky made a mistake. It's okay if I do it too. And then they can feel better when they are actually being able to do it on their own. Mm. So that would, those would be my two things for, for all you teachers listening out there. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, Allison, let everybody know where they can find you and connect with you online. Oh, I would love to connect with you guys, just like I connected um, with Jessica. 
And you can find me at mallettonmusic.com. That's my website. Or what's probably easier for most of you is my social media handle. So you can find me on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook at Mallets and Music. And I love posting things on um, Instagram, especially different lessons, ideas, highlights, all that kind of stuff. So you get a little peek into my classroom and what I'm doing on a daily or weekly basis. Aww. I love connecting with music teachers on there. It's like one of the best professional learning networks ever. Yes. So don't be afraid to reach out. You are not bothering her. <laughs> yes. No, please. Yeah. <laughs> Direct message me, you know, get in there, show, ask me questions, please, please, please. I love sharing and I love talking to other teachers because, you know, be a sponge. You've got to help each other out. We're all in this together to teach these kids. Mm, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I have enjoyed this interview. It's so very helpful and I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yes. Thank you for having me and thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you so much for listening in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, I would love for you to review the show and leave a rating on iTunes. To find out more about how I can help you gain momentum in your elementary music teaching career, head to thedomesticmusician.com where you'll find free downloads, courses, the blog, and so much more. Continue teaching music and never doubt the impact you're making each and every day in the lives of your students.